Dr. Van Teschner is renowned in the field of AAC. Uh, he is working with uh, an international, multidisciplinary international project involving 16 countries, um, becoming an aided communicator, aided language skills in children five to 15 years old. So, um, and this, what I know about Dr. Von Teschner, his his whole work focuses around um, the development of AAC as a form of language development, and that we need to start thinking and challenging ourselves to think more developmentally about um, how kids are learning language when they need to do so as augmented speakers. So um, a couple of other little plugs. Many of you have already heard this from me, but the new book, um, um, by Martine Smith and Janice Murray, who were the editors, The Silent Partner, Language Interaction and Aided Communication, has a, a wonderful chapter by uh, Dr. Von Techner and his uh, doc doctoral student, Christine, and I'm gonna mess up her name, Stan Sklev, on constru uh, constructing a language in alternative forms. And it was that chapter and ongoing dialogues with uh, Stefan that, um, uh, got me the courage up to ask him to come and join us today. So I'm going to quit talking because we want you to um, take the lead on this. So with no further ado, I will like to turn it over to Dr. Von Kitchener. So thank you very much. I'm very pleased that I've been invited to give this talk. And uh, as you know, I'm sitting in Norway. It's very dark outside and we are just past midnight. So it's a very good time or, you know, um, thinking. It's usually the best time, you know, except for those who are asleep, of course. <laughs> and um, I will talk about, I probably have too many overheads, and I probably, well, if people want the overheads, they can also send me an email, which is, you know, on the screen and in front of you. And uh, I will be sort of talking to some of the ideas that I have in general about AC and, and uh, how we can make it, as you already pointed out, um, a kind of language development. So uh, this is sort of the focus, and I probably will focus mainly on aided language. And, and I emphasize, because I'm usually one of the proponents of sign language, which I think tend to be forgotten as an augmentative communication form. And I think it's very important. And I also think that if we think about AC as language development, it should somehow be informed by theories of language development rather than learning theory. And it will also be about that language development needs some kind of supportive environment, something that can support the child in uh, developing language. I always like the title of the uh, Andrew Locke's book, which was The Guided Reinvention of Language. But, uh, it's an old book from 1980. Actually, it's his doctoral dissertation. And also, uh, I think it's important that the aim of AC intervention should be to promote the development of autonomy and authentic communication. I'll come back to these terms and what I put into them. And Intervention may focus on scaffolding and teaching, and that may give some different results. I will talk a little about our project and what kind of things you are using there. And uh, if we have time at the end, I have some examples of children's own creations. You know, uh, I think that all language is a creative process when you develop language. And that means that children developing AC are sometimes using not what they learn, uh, or what they are taught, uh, actually what they learn, but not what they are taught. And instead they have their own solutions to this. So to remind you that language development is a process by which children come to share their culture's means of communication. That of course will be mainly spoken and to some extent signed language. And language development is biological both builds on and it promotes social abilities. And I think that the underlying drive in language development is to solve engaging communicative challenges. That might sound circular, but I, I really think that it seems like communication is a um, basic activity for humans. And 
because it is a basic activity, we will also all the time try to uh, engage in situations where communication will be the solution to the, the particular thing we are doing. But children, even though they are active language investigators, they cannot create language independently. They need guidance from the language supportive environment, whatever that might be. I also think that the uh, differentiation by Catherine Nelson, she talks about language internalization and externalization. And communication and is we, we gradually internalize the communicative practices of the culture by observing and interacting with adults and children. So we have somehow to learn the language around us. And since we couldn't be innate in, in any way, uh, even if you were a believer in innateness or uh, some kind of language acquisition device, you still have to learn the language around you. That will be the internalization. Uh, in some theories, they will talk about uh, a cultural tool that you, you learn. But Catherine Nelson also says that the other thing which in, sort of develops in parallel is to externalize language in the sense that you're able to communicate something which is inside you, which others do not know. So it is not just internalizing and copying and putting it out again. It is uh, in some way you externalize your feelings, ideas, wishes, and make them known to others. And um, this, of course, means that language is not imitation and repetition, but creative construction based on language experiences. So, of course, the point is, how do you get the right kind of language experience? How do you become able to externalize, not only to, to learn what people are doing around you, which is, might be difficult enough, but you can use what you learn from others to create something that is not an imitation or repetition of what somebody else did. I don't think this is very controversial. Um, the Patty Nelson's book, uh, Young Minds in Social Worlds, I think it's a very good book, by the way. So now, my idea about AC is that it represents a developmental pathway to communication and language competence. So it is one of several ways, and of course, it's an unusual way, it's an atypical way, and of course, which means that you don't have the same kind of environment. But I also, uh, and, and I feel quite strongly about this, that children use communication aids or manual signing because they are speech impaired. But we don't need to talk about them. We don't have to take the, the non-vocal, the non-speaking or, or something because it only tells us what they cannot do. Uh, and the aided language is not the deficit. You know, sometimes it's treated as something really bad you know, it's like you got a flu, a really bad one. But all forms of language development are significant achievements. And I think, you know, this is a, an achievement. And that's why I often like to talk about aided communicators. Then I know how they're communicating or signers. Unfortunately, in Norwegian, we cannot say like that. So, and, and, and for the other reason, I'm not so happy about the complex communication needs because it doesn't tell me anything about what kind of communication is this person using. I think this is the important information for me. Of course, if you don't, if you use an alternative communication form, it is because you have some kind of problems with speech. I mean, otherwise you don't need to do it. So it's implied. But what we really want to know and want to, and, and want to, to admire is that you actually can learn in a different way. And, you know, when the development of AC is possible, it means that somehow the child has characteristics, abilities that interact with the parameters of these systems and makes them able to develop communication and language. Of course, this may not be so difficult with the relatively high functioning cognitively high function children with good comprehension of spoken language which are who are just uh, uh, motor impaired 
But of course, this is also true for children with autism spectrum disorders, intellectual disability. And of course, it has been demonstrated many times that children with limited speech can communicate for a variety of purposes, provided they are given the means and opportunity. And of course, this is a big difference, is that they need a planned language environment. Other children, they, they just swamp up, you know, they, they learn thing just by being in the world and they learn a lot of language and they probably they also learn a lot of language we don't really want them to learn. But here we have to have a plan. But I also want to emphasize that for children with severe motor impairments, and you know the project that Cathy talked about is about children with severe motor impairment who are relatively high functioning, that communication and language may in fact be their best skill. They may not be able to do anything except with the language, in whatever form that language may be. Now, the, the theories are intellectual tools for explaining typical and atypical developmental trajectories. So, you know, we are trying to find out, you know, what kind of processes they are about, how this works, what kind of abilities are underlying them, what are uh, the connections between different abilities with experiences, whatever is inborn, and so on. There are many different uh, conceptualizations of language development, from you know the strict nativism of the uh, Harvard people, you know Spink Pinker and those, Chomsky of course, and over to the learning theories, you know the uh, uh, who don't usually have much uh, impact on the discussion of language development in the uh, verbal behavior uh, book of Skinner has mainly an historical interest. Now, in the current non-nativist theories, language emerges as a result of social construction within a biological framework. I think that is a quite, you can put a lot of things into that box. And it means that the emergent language competence is a function of the child's developmental achievements and social interactions with guidance from more competent language users. And the interaction partner's ability to engage in conversation and create shared context. So it's about the abilities of the child. It's about how the child develops and it's about how people in the environment are able to engage in conversation and create different kinds of, of conversation about different things. So there is a biological foundation in including the body, you know, the embodied cognition, and the environment can vary. And some children need a, a very in, adapted environment in a way this is what we're talking about. And it's, uh, I think most people have some kind of implicit and, and also many explicit assumptions about language development. And this, of course, will, for practitioners, this will determine how they try to promote language and communication. You know, that your beliefs about what is working, of course, will be your guide to what you're trying to do. And there is kind of a dialogical relationship between theory formation and empirical study. But it, it is, seems to be difficult to formulate a sound theory. And I don't go into what a good and sound theory, you know, it has to have hypothesis and all kinds of things, it has to be testable, first of all, of, for example, aided language from observations of natural speech and aided communication and theoretical uh, reflection and translate the theory back into practice. And the reason I say that is that it's not very much done. It's, it's, uh, it's almost a little surprising how little uh, developmental discussion and theory there is in the field of AAC. There is a lot about technical things, about AIDS, about intervention, and so on, but very little about what kind of process that there might be. So if you have some kind of theoretical perspective, so what would be the practical implications for internalization and externalization? For example, if you, if you think externalization is an important process, uh, how would you try to make that possible in your intervention? So we have to think about what are the relevant processes. Just so you should have something else to look at than my 
slides, which tend to be, you know, black and white and so on. I, I like this thing here, um, which is an art. And, you know, this is the theory. And as you can see, it's quite abstract. I'm not sure what you could formulate from that. This is the practice. And it is about how do you go back and forth between these two? Sometimes we make very grand theories, which has very little to do with the practice, and they will look like that. If you wonder how you get from there, this is actually a, a, a set of pictures by Rock Lichtenstein, cow going, cow going abstract. And you know, when when we when we see the elements and the way they are going, we can actually understand how you can get from the cow to the abstract. Then again is. When you have formulated the abstract, how do you go back to the cow? So this was for your entertainment. Sometimes it's good to try to make uh, literal presentations of metaphors. I like that very much. Thank you. <laughs> so I think one basic premise is that language develops from social interaction. I think you, we, we cannot. Uh, I don't think anybody would disagree with that. I think there might be a discussion about how that social interaction should be. But it has to be uh, uh, created together with. And then um, social interaction may take different forms, have different qualities. And I think we, we have to realize that some will and some will not contribute to development. They don't have to be bad. I'm not talking about uh, that. But there are some that will and some that will not. And I think that intervention with AAC, that the important thing is that it should support authentic communicative interaction. Now, authentic, by this I mean that it is a communication that comes from the child and which is not something the child has been told by the other person to say or to repeat or to relay, and the other person already knows. And this may sound trivial because we do this all the time. You know, we tell stories, we listen to other people's stories. We all the time we are communicating about things we didn't know, and uh, uh, we are attending school and and so on. But it is not surprisingly, it is not much researched. You know what how that process is. It's it's sort of used as a kind of game sometimes, barrier game, but it's not really uh, research. So when we go back to the language environment, um, it is um, it has to have a language acquisition support system, and uh, this is not what Bruno calls it. You know that, and uh, you probably know that this is what he said that. Uh, when Chomsky said that children have to have a language acquisition device, a lad, then Bruno said that a lad needs a lassie. So, and that was the language acquisition supports them. It was a lass. And the language environment is children's main source of language practice. They learn how linguistic expressions are used in their conventional use and how they may be used creatively. You know, you do that by seeing how others are solving their ways of communicating with others. And, and again, the language support in the mind should not only be something that supports the child's effort. Uh, in a language supportive environment, communication and language should be affordances. In a Gibsonian sense, that's an action possibility. You know, Gibson says that when we see the world, we don't see um, squares and rounds and, and so on, and, and, and but we see the meaningful things, but also we see what we could do. So for us, the, the, when we can walk, the floor would be walkable. Uh, for a fly, the roof would be walkable. The ceiling would be walkable, I mean. So there should be affordances where we should be able to perceive the world as possible for communication and language. And of course, most children grow up in an environment that supports language development and is communicatively accessible. Now, communicative access is a term we 
developed because you know uh, politicians and others were all the time talking about physical access. We have the rules for how tall buildings can be before they have an elevator. We have rules for the uh, pavements so that uh, they they slope so you can easily get on with wheelchairs and 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 also the children parents with children in the wagon they can go easily. So there are many good things about that. And uh, so communicative access, in a way, is a parallel to that. And it means that there is an environment that acknowledges the child's need for alternative means of communication and provides the child with a language form that the child is able to use for expression. So this is part of, part of that. Then there must be people in the environment who understand the child expressive communication and can answer in a way that the child understands. That may be spoken language, but it may also have to be in the child's own form, depending on, you know, again, the comprehension uh, of language by the child. And communicative access also means that there are people in the environment who, masters, who master the child's language better than the child, so they can scaffold the child's language form and from whom the child can learn. So this is inaccessible. It doesn't mean that that uh, all children will develop to a very, very high level. This, this will depend. But uh, communicative access means that it will be possible for the child to learn from the environment. The language environment will be supportive, so you will have as good a language development as may be possible. I am... Um, I like to bring in the macro level on this, uh, maybe because we are a little proud of that in Norway. In 2012, August 1st, actually when we were in Pittsburgh, um, the law of education in Norway uh, got a new paragraph about the rights of people developing AAC. And it says that students who are completely or partially lacking functional speech and in need of augmentative alternative communication should be allowed to use suitable forms of communication and the necessary means of communication for education. So, and the important thing is that this is in chapter two of the law of education in Norway. And the chapter two is not about special education, it's about language. We have other minorities. We have people who speak the Sami language. We have people who speak Quent, which is actually Finnish. So they, and we have people who are deaf and use sign language. So they have special rights when it comes to education. They may or may not need special education, but here it is only about whether they need another communication form. The important thing about this is that the schools are now responsible for making the schools accessible in the sense that there must be somebody who knows the communication form of the child well enough for the child to function optimally in the school. And uh, uh, if the student does not benefit satisfactorily from ordinary education, you know, even if non-speaking, or will not be able to do so. The student has the right to special education according to the rules of Chapter Five. So the Chapter Five is about special education, and we have, you know, we have a general education law for everybody. And education, you know, a C might be part of the special education, but the right to use it, and that you actually can require that there is somebody in the school who knows your communication form best, and, and of course it, it essentially would also mean that the other children in the school would have to learn it. This is now in the law of education. We work together with the uh, Department of Education, and uh, we were very happy with uh, with uh, this law. And it, it's I'm going to have to, Kathy, hmm? I want to interrupt you for, I'm, I, I, uh, I just think this is a remarkable law, especially given that it is a access to language focus and we have some um, accessibility legislation that focuses primarily on 
vision and deafness, although it's also primarily more around adults. But it, um, this law, is it unique to Norway? Do you know? I've never heard of anything quite so, um, I want to say quite so wonderful as this. Uh, do you know if the other countries are adopting this or is Norway? Um, I, think, yeah. the I think we, we are the only one who has this law, but of course I, I couldn't be sure about that. You know, it's a good idea. So somebody else might also have the idea. Yeah, well, we hope so. Good. Thank you. Sorry. Just for your interest, so you can see here that it's in Norwegian. I thought that might be interesting for you to, to learn a little Norwegian. And, uh, and there is also a, a law for, uh, for adults. So this, uh, this is another chapter which has to do with, with adults who are um, also lacking functional speech. They also have you know, the, these rights. So, but at this adult education, which is a, a different thing, but it was also introduced at the, at the same time. The link on the bottom is to the Norwegian laws. Uh, but I think you have to read Norwegian. Yes, I thank you for translating it to me. There's a question from the chat as well. People are asking, does that mean that they get funding as well? I'm thinking for devices, supports, and services, um, because I know that there are people here who are struggling to um, access funding, especially for equipment, but I would also think, given what you're talking about in terms of accessible communication funding to support that. So um, there is, with, with the law, is the law supported by um, ed, uh, educational dollars in, in Norway as well? Yes, and uh, it, it was, it, uh, the funding was never a problem. Not, no, this has, the funding was not particularly related to this law. Love it. Funding not but, a problem. <laughs> because you know, if you really need a communication aid, it's free. Yeah. And and <laughs> if, if you need help in school, it's free. You know, in <laughs> uh, we very often find the long discussions about funding a little bit boring, <laughs> because it's essentially taken care of. You know, we are a social democratic welfare state, so it it doesn't mean that everything is perfect. Far from. But it means that these kinds of things are, are generally going all right. It's always a problem when you are sort of not, you know, on the on the border of some kind of benefit. But it, when you clearly need it, it, it's not a problem. That's lovely to hear as well. Thank you. So here's another Norwegian for you. Um, and that if you go back from the from the macro level, which I really think is important, to the micro level, uh, you know, of proper, then we go back to to the scaffolding, and uh, the and scaffolding will be the support of children's problem solving development provided by parents and other adults and children. I'll talk much more about it, and and I sort of talk about communicative problem solving. It's just coping with situations that require communication. It doesn't mean that you, you know, you have a, a, a sort of special task or something. But everyday problems or, or challenges or things you have to do in everyday life, they will be full of communicative problem solving. We we do that all the time. And of course, there have to be some more competent members. And um, you you may know that the the Original, the scaffolding metaphor came from this task where the, some mothers of young children should help their child to build a copy of this uh, little tower. And uh, the help the mothers were given were uh, sort of called scaffolding because, you know, the scaffold went well with that. But I, I like to, to think that we should not be too limited in our thinking about scaffold. So, Children who have different strengths and difficulties would need different kinds of scaffold. And you know, you can have this sort of quite simple one. Here we have a little bigger one, and uh, an even more large, larger one, and uh, and quite impressive. So they come in all kinds. The basis of thinking scaffolding 
is and this, of course, is the Vygotsky the theory, although you know, many other people talk about it, is that it's the child who is driving the learning process. So it's, it's different from teaching, because in the teaching, it's the adult who is driving the, the process. And of course, the, I think teaching is, is good for, for many things, but it's a, it's a different kinds of process. And, and I think that when here is about what is the in point of the environment, will the in, the environment is something that the child needs to cope with, with it for different reasons. It has to investigate it. It has to uh, master it in, in different ways. But it's also the the world that the, is is uh, 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 helping the child. So it's 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 both for something the child uh, is uh, uh, investigating, learning about. And it's something that helps a learned child in that process. So children are trying to make sense of the physical and social world, and scaffolding is helping them to do that. And it's the children search for meaning, and then it's the difference in competence between children and people in the community. So you have more competent people, and they can guide you in your search for meaning in the world. And this is the main source of true, important, cultural relevant knowledge, including knowledge about words and sentences. So, you know, this is the humans are, are social beings, but they are social beings in so many ways. You know, we, we talk a lot about attachment and so on. But attachment is also because it makes it possible for us to investigate the world in a safe way. But the other side of attachment is always exploration. And I think we can, in a way, it's a little bit, little bit about like the internalization and externalization. We have to learn about, we have to learn the language, but then we have to use it in different ways. We have to learn about the, we have to learn about the world and we use what we learn about the world to investigate the world. So it, it goes back and forth. And I think we, we miss something if we don't have both sides of that process. One of the things uh, is that much of the communication of young aided communicators is part of routines where they don't really have a true responsibility. You know, um, it's like the father who, who said, um, so was there an animal, animal in school today? Was there a dog? You know, uh, I know it because it was in the book. So. The child didn't really have to do anything but smile and indicate yes or something, because um, the, the, he was not the driver of this communication. He was just acknowledging it and, and waving happy, <laughs> interacting with his father. But, but there wasn't really any com communicative responsibility in it. So the question is, you know, how could we support the child in becoming an active agent and the driving force in ASE development? I know it's a little romantic to say, you know, and, and of course that there are lots of difficulties in, in saying that, but I still believe there are, there are ways where they could do it. So it's not like saying the right thing. It is having something to say that I would like to know. So the child needs real communicative problems to solve, and the adult should be able to guide the child's own attempt to solve the problem. So it's it's not to sort of teach something, and 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 you know this is one of my uh, things that I am concerned about. I think it's that too much of the research, and and it's not that it's not valuable to do research on that. Is you know we we describe a child, we teach the child something, and then we find out that the child learned what we taught, which is not bad. It's actually better than if the child doesn't learn it. But here it is not only about teaching and whether the child can do that, but it is, are we actually able to guide the child when the child is trying to solve a problem that we might not even know what is in the beginning? And I think that if we focus too much on routines and repetitions, it may not foster creativity and productivity in language use. And, and particularly, I'm thinking now much about aided communicators who are physically disabled. So much of their time 
of the day is full of routines and repetitions, and things take a very, very long time. Um, I've sometimes spent some some days on, on summer camps uh, with severely disabled children, and, and it takes a long, you know, the breakfast getting up. And I mean, I've been to summer camp myself when I was a little boy, and you know, we just got up, ate food, and was out doing you know, most things we could without anybody noticing us. And here, there is so much routine and repetition. This may be good for children with autism spectrum disorders, but it shouldn't be for everybody. So scaffolding implies that true social interaction is necessary to enhance development and education in general. So again, I, I think we should have a greater focus on the authentic communication and co-construction that leads to scaffolding practice so that you know children can develop a m more broader and actually use their communicative resources. Now, the important thing about uh, scaffolding uh, is that the child must understand the task. Essentially, that means that it has to be within the zone of proximal development that I'm sure you're all familiar with. The, the lower end on the um, so the proximal development is when the child cannot do it on its own, but he can do it with help. The upper limit is when the child doesn't understand the task. If the child doesn't understand the task or what it's about, then you can do it a hundred times and you can solve it for the child, but the child will not learn from that. So it must be meaningful for the child to be active and to attempt to solve communicative problems where they see. So that can be scaffolded. So, and we should be aware that co-construction is a common element in conversation involving AC, but it is not often, uh, but it is often non-scaffolding help. So you, you might have to help the children. So the question is, is your co-construction solving the problem here and now, or is it actually helping the child to become a better communicator? This is the whole idea about scaffolding is that it supports development. It's it's not so much that it helps you here and now to, to do this particular problem or solve it or do a task, which might be, be okay. But uh, the question is whether it is for the future. The, the, the child will become a better communicator. And that means that if we are going to be able to scaffold, we have to understand the nature of the child's contribution. We have to know that now the child is not actually contributing very much because we know it all. Then we have to know when the child is knowing the <coughs> is leading the <coughs> conversation and we are trying to see what we can do to help. And a lack of such understanding, I think, would be a hindrance in scaffolding AAC development. Well, um, we have been been trying to to look at some of these things in in our project that becoming made speaker, and essentially much of it is about how are children, both typically children who are speaking naturally, and aided communicators, uh, five to fifteen years. So when they are communicating to another person, something that the other person cannot see. How do they do it? You know, we of course it's a much easier task for speaking children, so they are in a, in a way doing more of the task. But this is not important. We are much more interested in how they do it. So one of the thing is that we they are showing a, a, a picture, a, kind of a visual scene with some content, and uh, you may see it, this is one of them, and you should uh, realize that it's. Uh, drawn by Janice Murray, who is in, in, in our project. We're very lucky to have a really good artist. And so this is a, a scene that's quite easily described, while this one will give children um, a lot of the problems. And uh, of course, it's uh, borrowed from Magritte, uh, but it is much more difficult to describe, because you cannot use 
the, the partner cannot use an ordinary scenario. And what we see often is that the, the partner tries to take over in what they believe is, you know, in, they're trying to be helpful, they're trying to solve the problem, but they're not paying so much attention to what the child is contributing, sometimes really forgetting it. We also have uh, another type where um, we, we, the child is, is using instructing and constructing, we call it, which is kind of play. And it means that the child again has a model the partner cannot see, and the communication partner is instructed, for example, to dress a, a doll. We have different ones. So the, the doll you see, and it's not so orderly, it's actually all that. The doll you see is the one who is in the child box, and the rest of the stuff is what the partner has. And the child has to, ex uh, to uh, put on whatever the child says. Uh, and, and the child can, of course, watch the other, uh, the adult and correct and monitor and, and all those kinds of things. And um, we, we, have it, we, we think that children often cannot play. Um, motor dis disabled children cannot play because they cannot you know, do the, all the, the physical stuff. But if they use language for action, they can uh, do the same things but only somebody else is doing the physical. And, and I think this is uh, uh, something that children should be quite, uh, you know, uh, who are aided communicators, they, they should be quite skilled. So we would actually thought that maybe they would be better than, um, than normally speaking children, but uh, they were not. I'm not showing you results because we, uh, we are writing these things up. But what we, so was that many of the children were creative, but they were also lacking experience with telling about unknown things. And they were really bad at elaborating and clarifying the message when they were not understood. Because, you know, they had such a limited vocabulary. You know, most of them were not um, writing, you know, with the, with the letters. And, and even if when they were, they, they were not that good spellers, you know, uh, so to, to get around. So, and when you have a limited vocabulary where you actually have to use a lot of your vocabulary uh, to say much more than we do with each word, to, to put it that way, then you don't have so many synonyms. You don't have so many substitutions. It's not so easy to, to you know, construct a new message, which might be a lightning. That, of course, means that it's not so easy to find exactly what the other person needed. So. We think that this is, is not something that uh, they were good at. And uh, we think that the environment, it, it, it's much more that the, the adult uh, takes, the, for example, a Lego block, which we, we also use, and says, um, uh, should I take this one? Should I place it here? And the child only has to say yes and no. And never gets to say that, take that one, put it there, build this, do this. And in a way, the environment fails to utilize the children's best skill, which is language in these cases. So they get you know, into new kinds of participation with this. And of course, they learn language by doing this. And they, and they learn, uh, and the important thing of this is, they learn when they are successful in their communication. They learn when did it work, when didn't it work. What, then you can come on and you can sort of scaffold and say, oh, well, maybe you could say it like this and that. And, uh, but it, it, it shouldn't be sort of too much about uh, correcting all the time. Here they, it's the co-construction is you know, a, difficult, it's a different thing. And the co-construction should be messages the partner does not know beforehand, because that's a very different process than you know, when I'm helping you, it doesn't take too much time. I, I, you know, I want to help you. I know what you want to say, so I, I just get passed through it because these, the, I think one of the things that there is not so much research on, on things like this is that it actually takes a very, very long time. And um, we also found it interesting that many of the teachers, special teachers, 
they they really like the tasks and and they would like to use them in the class and say, oh, I could do this, you know, and I say, yeah, you can just make your own and you can make it with peers, you can do it with this. And it, it's a good thing when you have communication with peers because um, I always liked the book by um, Matt Sons of Sam, which was called After the Children. And one of the things that these were speaking children, but uh, physically disabled in wheelchairs, and say, they felt less disabled when they were helped by peers than when they were helped by assistants. So by introducing peers uh, and doing things together with peers, it was all right to be helped. And the peers, you know, they knew them, so it was all right. And I think this here also is, is true. We, we had some very good conversations with, with the children in class. But of course, the, the, the competence asymmetry that I talked about before, which is sort of the, the basics for the scaffolding, is both larger and smaller. So it's larger because other people can speak. Because they are able to speak, they of course have a much larger repertoire. They can talk about all kinds of things. But it's smaller because other people have only marginally higher, and I think sometimes even lower, alternative language competence than the children. So it's not so easy that uh, the person who is scaffolding should ideally be more competent than the child. We have some examples of the, the a teacher and the child, you know, learning together, sort of in, in parallel, and that has always been very good. But uh, of course, uh, you, you have to be a teacher who, who really uh, can manage that kind of, of situation. And of course, to do this, you should know about the typical and atypical developmental course of the child's communication form. So how is it that children become aided communicators? What can they do at different times? One of the things that we see when we, when we look at descriptions of children using communication aided or other forms of communication, they say, oh, he has a communication aid. Uh, he may have a certain vocabulary. He has shown so many signs. But if the child has speech, it will be a long description of the child's sounds, which words and, and sentences and, and uh, of course, tests and things. But the communication form the child is actually doing, uh, using, is, is not really described. And of course, it, it, it just shows it has a different kind of status. And then, of course, scaffolding is an unfolding process. I think this is a, a problem that we see very often, that uh, the, what, what the parents and others do should be reduced or changed. So if you don't have scaffolding, it might hinder a child's learning. But when you have unnecessary help and encouragement, it may function the opposite to scaffold and reduce the child's self-efficacy and feeling of competence. Because, you know, we. Uh, there is a, a tendency for, for praising for everything, particularly for children who are disabled. But a praise in means that now you transgress or you, 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 you uh, were better than you were usually. You know, when, you, when, you, when we uh, are, are, are praising children, it is because they did something that we didn't think they could do, or, or at least we know they have been striving with it, and, and so on. And, and so when you praise for something uh, that is not uh, really special, then you are in a way saying, oh, can you really do this? I didn't think you could do it. Um, I will not go into that, but uh, there I'm is gonna, a lot. I'm going to interject a little bit. I hear people often saying, oh, good talking, or so th that's what you're, that's in a very extreme <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> the the uh, there there are different aspects of this. You know, this was one aspect about you know the, the, it implies an evaluation of what the child can do. Right. But the other thing is that if you say good communication, you are not answering the child. You are you are giving the child a grade. In 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 fact, right. Scullin and Scullin they have a book about uh, international communication, and and they say. And I don't know if there are many uh, pedagogues here, but they they say that well, if you if you speak to people, 
you get an answer. If you speak to a pedagogue, you get a grade. <laughs> nice. I'm mean, terrible. I don't know what to say about that, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And and um, so and and the person who says or said that you shouldn't praise people for communicating is Skinner, because he says that, and and you know, for once I agree with Skinner. He says that the the idea about communication is that it should lead to some kind of reply from the other, you know, successful communication means that somebody will answer you or do something or whatever, you know, that you might be. For pra but you don't talk to be praised. Uh, and therefore, you, you, stop the, you stop the situation before it has come to the end. So it, it's a, just a meta comment which has nothing to do with the communication. I actually have a, a slide on that a little later, so we, we will come back to that. And I also think that, um, as I already talked about, the scaf there are some scaffolding and some non-scaffolding assistance. And I, scaffolding is not just help, it must support development. And non-scaffolding assistance can be useful or necessary, you, you know, you help children with solving uh, problems, you know, you, they, you might help them with things they will never be able to do. But then it's a it's a different kind of things, and it, it's it's all right. But you must be, be sure that when you are trying to develop the child's language, are you giving that kind of help that actually will help the child later? And it's not uh, it's the competence. It's not the increasing frequency. It's it's very strange. We have this very often that um, they show how many times they used it and and so on. And of course, we know it is possible to influence. Uh, language use uh, by reinforcement, and sometimes, you know, that can that can be useful, but you don't teach that. You don't teach language with that. That is another thing. And you, and it, when you take away the reinforcement, till uh, an individual will not lose the ability to communicate. He might do it less, but it's not about the learning. It's not about the competence. It's only about what he's actually doing. And then, of course, you have to ask, what kind of Things should you do that would promote uh, what the child is doing? And uh, and again, you know, this is something about the same. But some function, some interventions focus more on form than on function, on producing or increasing a frequency of a response, or avoiding some kind of unwanted behavior, uh, rather than on developing the child's possibility to realize communicative intentions and goals. You see. There, we, have, we, we can have different goals with what you're doing. And I don't say that all non-scaffolding interventions are, good, are bad, that we should be aware when we're doing this and the others. Now, some of the things that we do often is to some extent good. Um, that, uh, for example, we, we focus a lot of choice. Early intervention is often a focus on choice making which is not bad because, of course, it's, it's good for the child to be able to make some decisions in life, to communicate. But communication has many more functions. And how much should you choose? So when choice is established, I think scaffolding should focus more on the child communicating something about interesting people, animals, things, actions, events, and different situations with different communication partners and for different purposes. So. Choice might be good in the beginning, and, and of course, but when you can do your choice, you don't have to learn it again and again. You rather have to learn, you know, what kind of symbols would mean and what can you use them for, and you can use them to communicate about different things. Of course, there are children who can only learn choice and may stop there, but I don't think that is, is really necessarily that many. And also, the, when you scaffold the expression of choices related to needs, is that in most homes are limited and fulfilled through everyday routines. And they may not have so much communicative value as supporting structured conversation and narratives, you know, telling about things and in different ways. And also, the, when you choose something and you get it, with the activity or something else, the communication is over. You know, you, it, it, it very often does not lead on to other things. 
so so again this is about uh, uh, you know and and it's 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 not the only thing you do and and of course it's important for the child to to do choices but it may not be something you have to focus so much of the scaffolding on it might be other things which will be more important so after you move on uh, and again I'm Stefan, I'm going to just interject here again. I know that we've had um, people like Linda Burkhardt and people come to Alberta who are really working with some of our most challenged children. And, you know, one of the things that she's reminded me and I think others of is that um, if a child doesn't make a choice, it might be that they're making a choice, that those aren't the things that they want. Uh, and that we are really potentially potentially making judgments based on very poor um, very poor inputs rather than um, giving them uh, you know our our a, a talking child could negotiate or say i don't want any of those or whatever so i I really appreciate your also um, talking about the limits of doing choice making as an AAC intervention, so thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. So, and and then I try to, to distinguish between teaching and scaffolding. And and as I said earlier, the teaching is, is often an important part of AAC interventions because, you know, it has to be planned in a different way. We have to provide the children. So, so teaching can be very good. But again, I would like it to sort of support the ordinary processes so that the, the teaching is not sort of having its own life independent on what is the the, the daily communications of the child and interact social interactions with, with other people. You know, I think the teaching somehow should support that. And, you know, and, and uh, we may be in a good situation to, to find out what we should teach the child. The child cannot fully um, decide his own teaching. And you know, if children decided their own teaching, we would probably we go back to the Stone Age. So we must have adults who make some decisions as well. So when I'm talking about scaffolding, it is because that is part of the child's activity, what the child is running. In addition to that, we also have direct teaching, but then it's not scaffolding. And uh, I know that in many articles, they, they are writing educational articles in many journals. They're, Educational article they call in the scaffolding. I I think it is not really that kind of process that they usually describe. It's it's very uh, adult centered instead of child centered. And teaching also sometimes means that the child would have to perform things he doesn't understand, and then we should be aware of that. Although we we have this expression in Norway uh, about uh, dry teaching. It essentially comes from swimming. So you do the swimming movements on land so that you should be able to swim. As, as you know, it's much better to learn to swim in water than to do it on, 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 the, on the land. So dry teaching typically leads to dry and limited competence. So again, you know, if you can do things in the ordinary situations, it will be a better thing. Then, of course, it's about the competence to scaffold. You know, the, again, scaffolding is based on the assumption that adults actually are aware of when children need and do not need help and the kind of help they need. And I think this may not always be the case for children developing AFC. And uh, as you probably all know, there are many studies showing that AFC is not much used at home. Um, uh, I think the uh, the, the recent British study, where 75% uh, of the children uh, were not using AC in the home. I think there are different reasons for that. But I think it may also be because the parents have, have not been sort of helped to get the right kind of competence to do the scaffolding. Uh, in, we interviewed parents here, and I interviewed parents before. Much of the teaching that the teaching of parents, in my experience, is the technical things. They learn about how, you know, which of course is, is important, when, particularly when children have electronic aids. And 
and then they they learn teaching so they they learn in a little way to be teachers and and when i say uh, what do you do to supervise the parents they say, oh they can come here anytime they want and, and see what we do sort of implying that the parents would like to do the same things that they do in school but you know school is work so at home you should be able to use communication for other purposes so at least uh, that may be part of it. Of course, it is also that they have routines, they know each other, and the parents decide, and they have lots of things to do. So I think it, it, it's not, I, will, I don't want to be simple-minded about, you know, why it's not so much use at home. But I think that it also has to do with the competence discussion. So if yeah. we... Hey, Stefan, I need to, inter I'm sorry, I'm to be interrupting you. It's five so i want to tell people that if you need to go and i know you might we are recording this but i don't want to um uh yeah so just just to let you know and um and and i also really want to also say at this point that i know i get lots of people saying well the families aren't going to use it at home so why should we do this but um i i think as you pointed out it is a complex issue that perhaps may be part of our own processes and teaching of and supporting of families that creates that so anyway good yes and and i i think of you know it, it i think this is always a complex issue as you say and but but i also think that if they don't do it at home then you say why should i do it in school why should i do you know this uh, scaffolding and help and help the peers and so on. But the moment you get on, the parents may see that they actually might need it sometimes. And besides, if the child doesn't learn it at home, he doesn't learn it at school, where should he learn it? Should we just say, well, if the parents don't want to be supportive of you, we will not support you either. So I, I think we just have to, to go on. As, you, I, as I think you know, I'm quite a lot in China. And in, in, in China, I was very surprised to, to discover that they don't think communication is important. I think in most other places I've been, I, if I talk about you know, alternative communication, which I do often, they, they, uh, uh, I, you know, the, the child's need for, co and for communication and the importance of communication in life is something like a pep talk I just mentioned, which I think that and just saying things that they know and agree with anyway. But in China, I have to find out that it is really bad for, and, and mentioning all the bad things that happened, you know, with uh, challenging behaviors and, and uh, not uh, that you don't learn so much and so all kinds of things that happen when you are not giving the kind of, of communication that you can use. This they understand, but that the communication in, in itself. So, of course, that means that when we are working on it, it's, it's the teachers who are doing a lot of that. But we think it slowly will also go to the homes. And then we have examples of the homes being the good ones where they are doing things and the teachers not so good. So we have it on both sides. Well, one of the things that I'm particularly concerned about is the is that we should promote competence in sibling and peers and not making them into teachers. I think sometimes when, when we, we see they have, they have been training peers, it's often about attitudes, which of course is, is good in a sense, and also making them into mini teacher or they, they, they mirror the, the teachers that they, and take that role. And uh, I, I think that uh, they, they are, I think with, uh, particularly with younger children, it's very often easy to get them alone and make them competent. And I think that it's better to make them competent that will change attitude than to try to change attitude without changing competence first. When they feel familiar with it, when they get to know it, when you explain about it, there's something about the brain and they can communicate in this way. Many young children do, do really well. So I think that the children are an important part of each other's environment. And uh, for uh, typically developing children, the peers getting more and more important with age. This is less so because of the other physical dependencies that the children may have. 
but still the the peers can be extremely important but we have to realize that they have to have to learn also and then they will be naturally natural scaffolders and this is what i talked about before um about the the reward and you know praise or uh, and we think it's important that we distinguish between communicative success which essentially means being understood and get an answer to to whatever you are communicating and uh, instrumental success would mean obtaining something. I think this is particular in the PICS and other sort of intervention based on behavior analysis. They are more concerned with the instrumental success than communicative success. And, and it's very typical that uh, many children um, who are uh, taught, you know, uh, in, uh, with the more behavioral interventions, they, they don't take no for an answer. With communicative access, I think things are getting much easier. So it's, uh, if they know they are being understood, because they are very used to not being understood, so they will just repeat, you know, in, until they, they hopefully will have instrumental success. But we think communicative success is important. And communication should be met with communication. And, you know, they should, you should not praise. Good communicating is, is not... So here's what I'm going to do, guys. I'm going to summarize a couple of things that I've heard, and I'm going to ask um, Dr. Ben Teschner to perhaps give a um, more feedback to us, or if you guys are interested, you can tell me that, um, to come back and finish his wonderful presentation. Um, so here's my big takeaway. So I'm going to do a little bit of a summary. Um, we need to really be focusing on the environment, on um, doing work to have ensure that we have more capable others who are able to scaffold for us to be thinking about kids who are also, and people in the environment who are also speaking my language. If I'm an augmented speaker, I love his idea of peer supports. I need to ask him how they actually bring peers in and intentionally teach those kids the uh, language systems of the augmented speakers. Um, lots of focus on scaffolds rather than direct teaching, um, but maybe most important, and guiding, not correcting. But my big takeaway from Professor Von Teschner is that we need to think about this developmentally in the way that we know kids learn, that we know um, from uh, uh, developmental psychology theories that we need to be approaching this, and that we need to be focusing on providing language, not AAC. I will find out from uh, Dr. Van Teschner what happened, and we will certainly um, if you are interesting, interested, try and get him back. Um, yeah, Amy and other folks, I could listen to him all day. I also highly recommend uh, a couple to buy those books because it is such a different way um, of thinking about AAC than than many of us have uh, thought about in in North America, I think. And my question to Stefan was going to be, why do you think we, in the world of um, uh, rehabilitation medicine, special education, seem to be, seem to gravitate so much to behavioral approaches?